Joining me now is Maggie Haberman, the author of the bestseller, Confidence Man, The Making of Donald Trump and the Breaking of America. We're speaking at the University Club of Chicago with its stunning views of Chicago on Michigan Avenue. So Maggie, welcome to Chicago and, and thanks for doing the show. Uh, your book is a chronicle in the sense of a big chunk of your life. Uh, Maggie Haberman has been covering Donald Trump since the 1990s. Maggie, you're the journalist who certainly most identified with him. Uh, you started out at the New York Times in 2015 after growing up in New York journalism at the New York Post, New York Daily News and Politico, and you were part of your team that won a Pulitzer in 2018 for reporting on the investigations into Donald Trump and his advisors. Uh, so much of your book is about the tribalism of New York that defined him, and I think in a sense defined you too. So could you explain how this New York tribalism impacted Trump and influenced how you covered him, maybe starting back in the day? Sure. So I first started covering Donald Trump intensely in 2011 when he was running for possibly running for president and considering it. He was, you know, he was omnipresent if you worked at a New York tabloid prior to that. Um, he came up in life in 1960s, 70s, 80s, New York City, when everything was defined by this us versus them mentality of racial politics, of class politics, uh, where corruption touched on various aspects of the construction industry, the real estate industry, the political landscape, and the media landscape. Uh, and all of these forces, along with his own domineering father's, you know, corner cutting and, and approach to a business, um, shaped who he was and how he looked at the world and foretold a lot of what this presidency was going to look like. When Donald Trump is talking about American carnage in his inaugural address, you know, he is evoking this very, you know, crime-addled 1980s New York that just was not at all what much of the U.S. looked like at that moment when he was about to assume control uh, over the federal government. Um, in terms of me, at the tabloids, that same world shaped how we covered New York. It shaped uh, a lot of reactions to crime. It shaped a lot of, uh, you know, the, the fixtures of the type of stories that showed up in the tabloids. And Trump himself turned himself into a commodity for the tabloids to cover, particularly the New York Post. You know, he had a pretty transactional relationship with the gossip pages in particular. Um, he was constantly, you know, placing stories about himself as a, a source close to Donald Trump. Um, and so understanding that that was how he operated helped me understand how he was going to operate as a candidate and as a president. Do you find that then you could trans you were able to translate better and analyze better what Trump was saying because, in a sense, you had that secret language in your head? I, I think that's a, a good way of putting it. I mean, I think that uh, I, I certainly uh, understood not just how he approaches things and his behaviors, but to your point, the behaviors of people around him. And that's so, especially with Trump, it's key to understanding any politician or yeah. any business figure. But with Trump, it is really key because he spends so much time pitting his staff against one another. Uh, so, for instance, I had been dealing with Roger Stone since 2002. Roger Stone is Donald Trump's longest serving, uh, you know, political advisor on and off, but political advisor with whom he has a very strange relationship, um, but uh, of, of sort of, you know, love hate. Um, but, but I started uh, encountering Roger Stone when Roger Stone was running an independent candidate in the governor's race in New York that year in 02. And I got a sense of how Stone operated. And then I started getting more of a sense of how the world around Trump operated. And so it did, it gave me, I don't want to say an edge, but it certainly gave me, you know, a base of knowledge to operate from as this whole new world was blowing up nationally. So one of the things you write about in, in the book is how uh, Trump lies. And by the way, to the point when you mentioned that when he was dealing with the tabs, he would call up and impersonate someone. Near the end of the book, you have an interview with Debbie Dingell, the congresswoman from Detroit, who tells a story where, well, you tell it. 
Sure. So I, it, it's not an interview with Debbie Dingle, but I do write about this this moment where uh, her husband has died. She takes his seat in Congress. Um, Trump uh, is helpful in some way with the funeral, and because of that, believes that she'll be indebted to him forever. And so when she makes clear that she is going to vote uh, for uh, in favor of impeachment in the first impeachment case against him, he goes nuts, and he attacks her at a rally. He attacks her late husband. He says, you know, something about he's looking, he's looking down on us, and then he says, or maybe he's looking up. And that was a you know, clear implication that he might be in hell. She tweeted her distress over this, and then she gave an interview on CNN the next morning where she talked about the need for civility in politics. And she gets a phone call later in that day from an unknown number on her cell phone, and it's a man, and the man identifies himself as a Washington Post reporter, um, and it's not a name she recognizes, and asks her if she's looking for an apology from Trump. And she says, you know, no, I'm just looking for people, something to be civil to each other or something to that effect. And the more they're talking, she can't escape the feeling that it's Trump. Uh, and those quotes from that interview never ran in the, in the Washington Post, uh, and she never learned more about the call. Um, you know, so I, was it Donald Trump? Maybe, maybe not. But it, so little is out of the bounds of the possible with him uh, that, you know, you can't discount it. On it. So you had three interviews with him for the book. And within the book, then, you have some fascinating... So people, when you see the book in the middle of it, uh, Maggie sent a bunch of questions typed up, and he answered them in his Sharpie. So I want to use this to transition a little bit into the author's craft. Uh, I found it fascinating that you put it in the book uh, as much as kind of looking over your shoulder as to how do you ask questions as a reporter. I'm always interested in that. Uh, what did you learn, or what was the point as, as in putting it in, in a book that is as much history as anything else? So it, it was exactly that, and it's a great question. I mean, it was, number one, it was the fairest way to address it. He answered, he answered them late. It was two weeks late. Um, you know, we were pretty low on time at that point. I thought it was the fairest way to just get his statements in, number one. Number two, I did think that it was... You know, for history, these are pres the former president's notes, to your point. And I thought that it offered readers a window into his mind and how he operates. If you read those pages of questions, you can see that he goes, you know, he starts out kind of cranky, and then he gets kind of bored, and then he seems to get engaged again, and I, I just thought it was an interesting travel for a reader. And one thing that you follow up on is something that actually has some local angles here. <laughs> so, Maggie, I am curious why you were so curious. So one of the things that Maggie writes about in kind of constructing how uh, Trump ben tries to bend reality to his mm -hmm. will is when he was a business person mm -hmm. and he was trying to get a casino mm -hmm. in what <laughs> I would call Indiana. Yes. Okay. Most people would call it Indiana. Yes. All right. Which, which is behind, you know, just behind me to yep. the south. Uh, it's not far from Chicago. And you, you have a story in there about, uh, again, you tell the story about, and I was surprised to see that you cared so much about it, but could you tell the story of how he was trying to move Gary, Indiana. Sure, and I'll explain why I cared about it so yeah. much. Um, so I started hearing this story somewhat early into the research for this book that when he was trying to s sell people on this riverboat casino that he was um, engaged with in Gary, Indiana, um, that he had, or that some someone, I should say, yeah. had doctored the prospectus, um, this pitch that was going to investors to show that it was basically adjacent to Chicago, that it was right next to Chicago. Obviously, it's not right next to Chicago. I think it's about a 45-minute drive. Um, and when somebody complained to him about this, you know, he said, well, you know, nobody, nobody's going to know because they don't live there. The reason I was so interested in that, other than it's just a strange story, and it's kind of a revealing story, is it, it echoed this situation where he drew on this map when there was a hurricane coming, when he was president, and he insisted the track was going to Alabama. And it had actually shifted by the time he said that. But in a meeting with aides, he drew 
like an additional cone suggesting it was going into Alabama and it wasn't and then that map got shown to the press. And so just, it speaks to Trump creating his own reality. It speaks to maps being adjusted. That's why I was so interested in it. And there's another, in a sense, a thing of uh, interest to me. When you write about uh, former Illinois Governor Rod Begovich, mm. so uh, he was in prison mm -hmm. and we knew he made a big play through mm -hmm. all his allies. He yep. had been campaigning and lobbying uh, for clemency. And you have an insight, you had two insights, and again, if you could tell the story, insight one, if you could tell us about why Trump cared. And, and he, from what I knew in my reporting, uh, Rod was on a track anyway. It wasn't outside of the realm of Trump doing it. But I, could you tell the story about what the timing turned out that he ignored? and why Trump really was interested in helping Rod. Sure, I mean, so remember, Rod Blagojevich appeared on Celebrity Apprentice, so that's also one thing you always yes. have to factor in. Um, but he would say to people, it's the same guys that went after me. There was an overlap on the prosecutors um, related to James Comey, and that really stuck with Trump. Mick Mulvaney, the White House Chief of Staff at the time, kept trying to push this off. He, he didn't think this was a good idea. He tried having members of the Illinois congressional delegation explain to Trump that Blagojevich's crimes <clears throat> were not just related to the Senate seat, but there was also some attempted extortion at somebody yes. running a children's hospital. Um, and Trump didn't care. And so, you know, there was this effort to suggest that this is beyond the pale. And for Trump, none of it was beyond the pale. And I think you're right that I think that he was, you know, this was headed in that direction anyway, but I think that Trump saw some personal identification in it. Right, and so the prosecutor, just to fill in, in the blanks, because our listeners will know, uh, the U.S. attorney at the time was Patrick Fitzgerald. Right. Yes. Patrick Fitzgerald, who knew back then, is personal friends of James yes. Comey. Once James Comey got into this controversy with Donald Trump, yep. Patrick Fitzgerald became his attorney yes. one on his team, advising him. Uh, and the idea that an enemy of my enemy, a friend of my enemy yes. is my enemy. Yep. Uh, it's everything for Trump. It's literally everything. I mean, it's, it's you just sort of, you hit on the, what is this transitive property nature of how Trump looks at everything in life, you know. A, a, um, a, a equals C because, you know, because I, I, because I think it does or because, you know, this person has a connection to that one. Um, and, and if this, this person even touches that person, then, then they're bad too. And Comey, obviously, is the fired FBI director, uh, you know, for whom Trump fought, blames everything in terms of a special counsel investigating him and just creating this kind of rolling set of, of events. Um, so much of his presidency becomes things that don't really connect that he connects in his in his mind, and that's one reason that incident was so interesting to me. Right, and I think this story is instructive. Locally, it's interesting. The other thing is, in terms of just Bogoyevich's luck, uh, that he the advice was to yeah. Trump wait until the second term. Correct. That was that was Mulvaney's advice. And, was and he was sentenced to 14 years. He would still be sitting there. Yes. Right now. Uh, so he he really lucked out with this notion that has still exists in the post presidency, doesn't it, Maggie? That you are connected to someone who is my enemy. Has mm -hmm. that ever abated? And did you see the roots of that in New York? Yes. Um, I mean, you know, he has always behaved this way in one way or another. Yeah. Um, I will say it has gotten more intense. I think that the situation with the investigation related to Russia when he was president, you know, hypercharged all of his existing impulses. Mm -hmm. And so, sure, yes, this this goes back to, you know, years ago. You know, for instance, um, uh, I don't write about this in the book, but I, there's a, there, there is a there was a situation where Trump had um, had somebody working with him, and there was a, a mutual friend involved, and Trump had a follow-up with a mutual friend, and then says to the third party, you're that person's friend now. 
Um, so that is, you know, that is how he operates. But it has become ex an extreme version of itself, just as almost everything else with him has become an extreme version of itself. So you also write in the book, and I gravitated towards it because it was about Governor J.B. Pritzker. Mm. You write about during COVID, yeah. there is an exchange. Could you tell us the exchange, and then I'll tell you my the, the, what I want you to help me analyze. Sorry. Sure. So this was one of the governor's calls that Trump was um, engaged with. And actually, it was Pence who had been doing these. And then on June 1st, 2020, which was the day of the Lafayette Square, or Lafayette Park march to St. John's Church, um, where there was this clash between uh, authorities and protesters, um, Trump is on this governor's call, and he's telling them they have to dominate, you know, dominate your states. Because remember, there were these protests that were rolling across the country, Black Lives Matter protests after George Floyd was murdered. And J.B. Pritzker pushes back pretty aggressively on Trump. And Trump gets angry in response and it basically tells him he needs to be, I don't have the book in front of me, but tells him that he needs to be doing um, he needs to be doing more in order to, um, to to control the situation. But Pritzker really stood out because he was one of the few people to really push back on that call as Trump was just ranting. So here, here's, uh, tell me if I'm crazy here. So you know, and you write in your book, the big first big project that let uh, Trump go from being his father's son, a Queens real mm -hmm. estate developer, to break into Manhattan was what became the Grand Hyatt. Yes. Who made the Grand Hyatt possible? The Pritzker family. I don't think that you're crazy. I don't know that that's what was driving him in that moment, but it could have been. But, so my, my thesis kind of, in the beginning, I think uh, there was some round table in person mm -hmm. at the White House, mm -hmm. pre-COVID, Yes. and I think JB sat next to him, and the word back I got, mm -hmm. they got along, mm -hmm. Because I thought when it's billionaire to billionaire, they're in the club. I'm, what is that a way that you would think of how uh, Trump might have approached JB? He might have, beginning? but I mean, it's 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 often very hard to tell the reasons why Trump is being nice to someone. It could just be that the person was being, you know, amiable with him in that given moment. It could have been whatever mood Trump was in. There is no question that Trump tends to do better with other people he sees as rich. Um, and, and there is no question that he knows the, he knows the history of the Prisker family yeah. with the Hyatt. Um, you know, and that often those kinds of connections do you know, roll around in his head. Um, but once Prisker was willing to push back on him, it sort of didn't All right, matter. then he became. Exactly. Yeah, that, then we're back to. Correct. I think. So by the way, from your national perspective, uh, Pritzker now is running for a second term. He's in good shape to be reelected. He's made a trip to New Hampshire. He went to Florida. Uh, in your analysis as a political reporter, do you would you put him on any list of potential candidates if uh, Biden didn't win, or where would he fit in the pantheon of, uh, of of this next crop of presidential candidates? He's somebody who is a Demo he, he he absolutely I think would be part of the Democratic bench. Um, I think it's very hard to say how he would play nationally, um, just given that, you know, he yes, he has some experience, uh, but it's just a very different milieu. One of the things that I've tried to avoid doing ever since, I mean, bluntly, from Wes Clark to Tim Pawlenty, yeah. you know, to Scott Walker in 2015, there are so many candidates who we on our side of the aisle have talked about. They might be great, and then they get out there and they're not that great. I would put Ron DeSantis in that category. I have no idea whether Ron DeSantis is actually going to be the juggernaut that Republicans think he is, and I don't think that anyone does. Yeah. Um, I think Pritzker's name would absolutely be among those considered um, if he wanted to run and if he wanted to get a look. But how he would fare is anyone's guess. Do you think if, given that, if Rahm Emanuel came back from his ambassadorship to <laughs> Japan, would he fit in or has his time passed? I think that in a party that's looking for fresh blood, if they're getting rid of the, a sitting president, I'm not sure that Rahm is going to be the person they are looking to. I mean, Rahm obviously is very seasoned and very experienced, um, but I think there is a desire in the party to find new faces. So speaking of moving on or moving from the White House, one of your big stories in your book is Trump's uh, inability to understand that he was coming to an end. Could you tell the story of how you came to learn and what he said? I mean, the quote is, uh, he's, quote, not leaving. So it was, 
I didn't learn about that until well after the second impeachment trial. Um, I think it was it was pretty obvious that he wasn't really willing to leave um, in real time anyway, given all the things that we reported on, right? Um, but uh, but that he was specifically saying that to people is not something that I knew when we were covering the, his final months. Uh, and it was striking to me because it just meant that people around him were aware of his mindset. My, my reporting was that he started saying this in the second week after the election um, when it was clear that it was over and Joe Biden had been declared the winner. Um, so many people knew that this was heading to a bad place who were working in the White House. And they, for various reasons, I think were not sounding alarms uh, the way they probably should have. So your book chronicles many of the things that were setting the stage for the January 6th commission. So as we speak, we don't know if there's going to be another hearing, mm -hmm. uh, if the Republicans take over the House, could be likely, uh, then they will be done. We do expect a report to be issued mm -hmm. with important documentation on it. Uh, but your book puts some of that backstory in. Uh, when you see the events that led up to January 6th, uh, is there any way you think that anyone could have, uh, in hindsight, have done more and who should they have been to set them off? And before you get it, I'm amending my own question. One of the more flagrant lies that he said, it has now been well documented in the January 6th commission that he was watching television yeah. that day. He tells you, and you write very clearly that you didn't believe him, that he wasn't watching right. TV. So one, could you just address being told how, how you deal with it as a human being and a journalist when someone is telling you something you know is not right? And then my first part of the question, if anyone could have changed anything. Sure, and so let me work backwards. In terms of you know him lying to me about not watching television, um, this was prior to the House Select Committee documenting right. in public what had happened under oath. Um, I knew from my own reporting, other people had reported it as well, that we were told he was watching television. When someone is saying something like that to you, um, <clears throat> I actually thought it was more important to get him on the record, even though I knew he wasn't telling the truth. Um, but I would rather hear what he was claiming. Um, I would always prefer it when someone is not lying to me, um, you know, and I, I would always prefer that I get an honest answer when I ask a question. Um, but, you know, we ask questions and we are not always told the truth. Um, he, um, he doesn't tell the truth more often than other politicians, but, um, you know, but, but he's not the first politician I've ever interviewed who says something that isn't true. Um, in terms of whether people could have seen it coming, I think that's a great question. What I would say is, um, I think that, and there's so much that we still don't know, and I don't know how much the January 6th committee's report is going to get into, you know, the Capitol Police, preparations, I just, I don't think we know yet. Uh, I do think there was a, a with, among some in Washington, not all, because we've certainly seen that there was information that the Secret Service had, that some in the crowd were gonna be armed. Um, and, and it's not really clear to me what they did with that. Um, I think January 6th and the lead up to it was something of a failure of imagination because what you kept hearing about was fears that he was gonna use the military to stay in office. And that was really, I think, just given his lack of understanding of how the levers of his own government worked, never the likeliest outcome, the far likelier outcome was gonna be what happened, which was that it, there was gonna be a crowd that got, um, you know, excited and, and directed. Um, and just given what we had seen with him at his rallies over you know, six years, seven, five years, that should have probably been uh, more anticipated. But the who on that one, I can't begin to narrow that down. So the other story you tell that then has been picked up by the commission and other reports is Trump tearing up documents because he just wouldn't accept that there was something called the Presidential Records Act. Uh, what was it? Is it he incapable of change, didn't care about the rules, thought they didn't apply? Uh, and then we know, to pick up and let me explain, this is now the subject of yet another investigation of Trump, yes. the Mar-a-Lago investigation, why he had boxes and boxes of documents, some classified, 
at his home in his press, post presidency. So Trump is sort of devoid of context. He treats every situation as if it's the same. And throughout the presidency, he continued to act as if he was a Trump Tower, where you know he ripped stuff up, he didn't like people taking notes, and so forth and so on. Um, my colleague Annie Carney um, wrote a story when she was still a Politico about the fact that Trump was ripping stuff up and people would have to tape them back together. I report in the book about the fact that he was actually flushing some of those down toilets, which was, among other things, not good for White House plumbing. Um, you know, no way of knowing specifically what it was that he was doing that with. Um, but he tends to behave as if systems shouldn't apply to him um, and refuses to accept that systems exist. Um, the White House staff often speculated, at least in the case of the flushing, that um, the people who were aware of it, that it was just things he didn't want people seeing. Um, but what that was could have been anything under the sun. So I think there are a couple of possible reasons why he was doing the, the ripping up and then why he took documents to Mar-a-Lago, and I just think there's a lot yet to be learned. So one of your other uh, stories is in your interview, you're asking him about documents and his answer, which when you pair it, you know, you wrote what you knew then and now what we know now. Could you tell me why you asked that question, what it meant to you at the time and what it means now? Sure. So Trump was famous in the White House, and I wrote about this in 2019, for waving the Kim Jong-un correspondence around, you know, uh, Kim would write him letters. Um, and Trump seemed to really believe that they were from him as opposed to you know, staff writing them and so forth. And he was very proud of this relationship. Um, I asked on a lark, did you take anything with you? Did you take any memento documents? Because there was also this issue where he had um, taken, that some gifts had disappeared from the White House. So I figured I would just ask while I was in this, in this interview. And he said, nothing of great urgency, no. And then he appeared to indicate he had some, if not all, of the Kim Jong-un letters. And I, I was surprised, and I said, you were able to take those with you? And something flickered across his face, but he kept talking. And I said, wow, or huh. And then he caught my surprise and said, oh, no, I think those are in the archives. Um, but, you know, we have great things, which it's a mushy statement. It doesn't, it, it was impossible to know what he was talking about. In hindsight, after, particularly after the August 8th search of Mar-a-Lago, I find it pretty revealing about mindset, and I find it pretty revealing about that his initial in impulse was to say nothing of great urgency. Um, because one of the durable questions now is, what did he have? What did he know he had? Did he intentionally have somebody pack all of that up? And so I just think this adds to our sort of general sense of things right. that he was saying. So in that hindsight, time. that was the tell. In hindsight, it was a reveal, yeah. A reveal yeah. on it. Yeah. So as we close out, I, uh, journalist to journalist, and we both came up through covering the streets of our respective cities that spawned us, uh, not in you know really brutally competitive news environments where a scoop, a scoop and an active verb and a lead are things <laughs> that make your day. Oh, the active verb. Uh, but you were attacked a lot by Trump. Uh, you still, you know, went around, but. Uh, did it take a toll? Uh, you know, look, I know about being thin-skinned, but, you know, sometimes there's a limit. The kind of attack, especially, uh, you know, the fake news stuff, uh, as we close out, how did it take your uh, toll on you? Generally, the fake stu news stu uh, attacks, you know, enemy of the people, bother me not on a personal level. They bother me because they're really bad. They're dangerous. And, you know, his words as a president were getting seized on by autocrats around the globe to crack down on the free press. On the stuff of me personally, like it, it's annoying in the sense that you have to deal with it sometimes, um, but it's it's just, it's noise. You know, he's not the first politician to attack me. He's not gonna be the last, so. And that's Maggie Haberman. Thank you for joining us. Maggie Haberman, the author of the bestseller, Confidence Man, The Making of Donald Trump and the Breaking of America in Chicago, ladies and gentlemen, at the University Club. Thank you, University Club for this wonderful space for our interview. Maggie, take care. Thank you.